Tonight, we introduce barbed wire to pay-per-view. Now that's not just the coolest, that's not just the best WGD Weekly, that's just incredible. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in, welcome to WGD Weekly with Stephen the Scum. This week, as promised, Stephen the Scum, go extreme. Former ECW champ Just Incredible will be joining us this week. You excited there, Scum? Steve, I am always excited to be back on board with my longtime tag team partner. You know that yourself. I'm always excited to be working alongside the uh, class act that is the boys over at Wrestling's Glory Days on Facebook. Always some top-notch material coming out of them. And, uh, yeah, you know I'm excited to, for the first time, finish up our hardcore double play, and Steve and the Scum are going to go extreme. I guess you could say, Steve, I'm about as excited as a man o' war in Portugal, my friend. Get out of here. Well, anyway, welcome aboard as a full-time admin to our page, Scum. I wanted to say that on behalf of all of the guys. We have another championship caliber admin here, folks. He joins the best classic wrestling website on the Internet. Let's move right along. It's been a few weeks here, Scum. We've had uh, Buff Bagwell, which got a lot of heat. Bushwhacker, Sheep Herder Luke was with us last week. I'll have to say he was one heck of an interview, man. And he's on the record as loving the Scum. Yeah, Steve, well, you know, I I would have to agree with you there. Bushwhacker Luke was fantastic. We thank him a lot. What a great guy. Um, great legacy that he had, him and his longtime partner, Butch, as the sheep herders and the bushwhackers. Uh, pleasure to speak with him. As far as him loving the scum, uh, I, I guess it just boils down to that old analogy. You know, it, how do they say it, Steve? It takes a scum to know a scum, right? Oh, I mean, get out of here. I mean, hey, I don't think I'll be running around licking anyone too soon. And I don't see myself uh, digging into a can of sardines anytime in the near future. Uh, personally, big fan of having all of my teeth. But uh, as for Luke and his love for the scum, all I can say is, you know, it's a man with 50-plus years in the industry. And obviously the guy knows a piece of can't-miss talent when he sees one, Steve. Oh, you got to be kidding me. How'd that old soda commercial go? I'm a scum. You're a scum. Wouldn't you like to be a scum, too? I mean, I got much respect for Luke and the legacy of the sheep herders and the bushwhackers. But, Steve, I mean, you have to be seeing it, too. I mean, it's not just him, man, with the love for the scum. I mean, it's hard to deny that scum, he's the latest sensation that's sweeping the wrestling radio nation, baby www.getoutofhere. That's right. Scum, listen, I've had a bloody feud with iTunes. It's coming to a head. Earlier today, I applied a move I like to call tie their heads in the ropes and fish hook them in the mouth, Abdullah style. And I actually got some results. So uh, to uh, Dane or Jordan or whatever the I hell your I name is, Scum, I know you recently been having a little eye issues yourself. Yeah, I certainly have, Steve. I guess you could call me the uh, eye scum. Uh, get, getting back to your Abdullah fish hook there, I, I was uh, going to get with our guest, Luke, and see if he wanted to help me construct one of those chicken wire cages that you could take I Jordan into and uh, put him through the ringer and see if we couldn't get our stuff back up how it should be there. Oh, that sounds good. Actually, you know what? Maybe if you weren't the eye scum, you could be a scummeroo with Bushwhacker Luke. <laughs> that works, too. That works, too. You know, doing the uh, bounce around town. I I think I can handle that. Well, as long as you don't rip your suit. But listen, folks, while we got you on the line, we wanted to thank you all for listening. We're not your typical wrestling podcast, as you could probably already tell. We're a show with two idiots that focus on the best classic wrestling moments from the annals of history. We're not going to give you any spoilers, and all of our guests are ones you can relate to from the glory days of pro wrestling. Visit our Facebook page, Wrestling's Glory Days, for the best classic content on the Internet. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Mr. Ah 33 or stream it right from Facebook.com slash WGD Weekly to follow Steven the Scum. We're going to be all over Facebook wreaking havoc. 
probably more so the scum than myself. But listen while I got you here, scum. Matt, I'm demoting him to our international correspondent to the intercontinental correspondent. I'm not quite sure if there's a literal difference between the two, but to me it seems like a demotion for the, for the booking of the foreign heels without letting us know about it. But here's the rub. He rebooked them again in the near future. So stay tuned, folks, for the League of International Heels because they're going to come back and try to match wits with CG Scum. Oh, boy, Steve. I'll tell you what. If those guys ever came back, that would be about a week or two too soon. Uh, I agree that demotion is definitely in order there. Uh, Matt, our international, or as you're calling him now, the intercontinental correspondent, Thanks for nothing, buddy, if you're out there listening, and I know that you are. Uh, get those <laughs> clowns in here screaming and hollering. If I had to hear Volkov fire up that anthem one more time, I think my head was going to split. But uh, I anyway. I had my head for three days after that. I was singing it in the car on the way to work today. Um, <laughs> next week, Steve, if I can remind the uh, readers, the new interactive features on WGD Weekly it will be the debut Steve's Gimmick Garage Sale, as well as our new segment involving yours truly, the scum, where the readers will have a chance to stump the scum. we got some great stuff that we're going to give away. Um, first, put an entry in for either the Gimmick Garage Sale or for Stump the Scum to steventhescum at gmail.com. Be sure that at the top, Tell us which contest you are entering. We need your name and your name on Facebook where you follow us if it is different from your name so we can shout it out over the airwaves here. Now, the debut of Steve's Gimmick Garage Sale simply works like this. What Steve is looking for is the most ridiculous, outrageous pieces of wrestling merchandise that have ever been released. He wants you to get a picture. He wants you to email it over to our email that I just read you, and we're going to pick out the most ridiculous one, and Steve is going to sell your item on the air. Like I said a couple weeks back, he could sell some oceanfront property in Muskogee to a drunk man at 2 in the morning, all right? So he will sell your merchandise. The winning entry from Steve's Gimmick Garage Sale will be receiving an 8x10 autographed photo of WWE Hall of Famer, the Boogie Woogie Man, Jimmy Valiant. Pretty good stuff for that. And then, that's right, that's the one, my man. Have mercy, the Boogie Woogie Man. So if you want to get your hands on an 8x10 autographed by Jimmy Valiant, get that merchandise into us at steventhescum at gmail.com. One lucky winner is going to have his stuff sold on a man, Steve. And then we move along to my segment. Stump the scum. Easier said than done, people, as I've been telling you. What we are going to be doing there is you're going to send along to the same email address. You are going to send in your question, SummerSlam 1988 through 92 is the category that we're looking for to try and stump the scum. Now, I'm not looking for some BS about what Monsoon and Superstar Graham had for dinner after calling the matches in 88. I'm not looking for some hogwash about where Sweet Sapphire hosed herself down after sweating like a stuck pig in 90 after the Spectrum show. That's inappropriate, Skull. Get out of here. Hey, she, trust me. Everyone was happier when she hosed herself down. Please. But some actual questions is what we're looking for, baby, on these classic events. You do your homework. You come prepared with those questions that you mail in because, like I've been telling you, baby, the scum is not some hick. The scum is not some hillbilly wrestling fan that doesn't have his homework done. And most importantly, always remember out there, and Steve, you always remember too, my friend, my name is the scum and I've got the brains, baby. you got to be kidding me. And if I could throw in at the end here, Steve, um, geez, let me shake, shake my head and get, get back here for a second. I'm not really sure what was going on there, but oh, here I am. Okay. Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I'll tell you what was going on. Your weekly heel turn. That's what's going on there, scum. I 
not exactly sure what you're speaking of, my friend, but uh, just trying to tell the readers the great prize that they can win if they do stump the scum. So yeah. we have a doozy for that. Uh, if you can stump the scum, <clears throat> and I don't think you can do it, baby. But anyway, if you do stump the scum next week, what you will be getting is a copy of Lex Luger's brand-new autobiography, <clears throat> and that's called Wrestling with the Devil. It is chronicles the life and times in and out of the world of wrestling with the total package, Lex Luger. The foreword to the book is done by the legendary Sting, Lex's good friend. And uh, if you can stump the scum, you're going to get a free copy of Lex Luger's new book. What do you think about that, Steve? That is pretty good stuff, folks. We got SummerSlam 1988 to 1992, Stump the Scum. If you stump the scum, you're going to win Lex Luger's new book. It's a fantastic prize. I got my gimmick garage sale. If you go, if you, if I choose your photo to go into my gimmick garage sale, you're going to get a photo from the boogie woogie man, Jimmy Valiant. Don't forget to email us at Steve and the scum at gmail.com. Send us your picks, send us your questions. I'll make sure the scum doesn't cheat baby. But we'll make sure that it's all on the straight and narrow and on the up and up. Don't forget to send your name so we can read it on the air. That's going to be some great stuff. Scum. Let's move on. We got it. We got the phone lines lighting up. I think Justin Incredible's with us now. While I'm checking, is there anything else you got to say to these people while I'm checking these phone lines? Yeah, one thing just to correct you there, my friend, is the scum does not need to cheat. In case you forgot, because he's got the brains, baby. Well, you know, hopefully Justin Incredible maybe slap some sense in you. I got him on the line now. He's the founder of. Pro Wrestling 101 on YouTube. Subscribe to his channel, Polacco Peter 73. Justin, you were trained by the legendary Stu Hart and the Hart Brothers up in Calgary. I believe this is where you first ran into your eventual tag team partner, part of the Impact Players, Lance Storm. Bring us back to your memories of training with Stu Hart, and also tell us if you can recall uh, your early memories of meeting Lance, working with him in the ring, and the friendship that you guys developed over that time. Uh, sure, man. Uh, well, back at this point in time, uh, you know, Stu wasn't really doing much. It was more the older brothers, uh, Keith and, um, oh, man, what was the, the other brother? I can't recall the, who the other brother was. I'm not sure. But it was mostly Keith Hart, the guy who was a fireman. And uh, by that time, Lance had come out of the uh, camp a year prior, and Chris Jericho as well. So, uh, really, Lance and Chris uh, really had a lot of hand in being in the ring with me and uh, and really training me. Did you develop a friendship along the way with Chris Jericho? Um, uh, not, yeah, I mean, I, Chris was actually, it's a funny little side story, Chris is actually my fourth match ever, and somewhere in the uh, in my DHS collection, <laughs> there's a match of a very young Justin Credible and uh, Chris Jericho in front of maybe 50 people in Calgary. So, you know, um, yeah, man, I, Chris was cool, but I really, uh, Lance was uh, somebody I really bonded with. Chris was, uh, Chris Jericho is always, you know, kind of the personality you see on TV is really what you get in person. I mean, he's a very fun guy, uh, you know, but very, you know, boisterous and kind of loud and, you know, in, in a good way. You know, he's just very charismatic where Lance and I were just a bit more uh, in tune with one another and we quickly became uh, became friends. Very interesting. Kind of sounds like another certain scum friend of mine that I know. We'll move on to March of 93 and PJ Walker, did, and you have a few months in the company, not necessarily the most successful in your career, but you get a big win over Mike Rotundo on Monday Night Raw, IRS. First, bring us through where you uh, were first discovered and approached to join the World Wrestling Federation, and who actually approached you to join the company, and regarding the IRS win on Raw, did that mean a, uh, a lot to you and your character at the time uh, to pull a big upset over a bat like uh, Mike Rotundo? Oh, I mean, it was huge. Um, basically, I was being used as an extra in those days, you know. Uh, you know, we'd, uh, we'd get a call, me and another handful of guys, um, you know, we, we'd get a call and, uh, you know, come in the extras, basically jabrones, to get thrown around in the ring. And, uh, you know, paid you 150 bucks, which is a great payday in those days. Um, you know, and uh, one day, um, you know, I did like me all along, uh, you know, because I was consistent, I was a good worker. Uh, looked good, you know, and uh, the heart name certainly helped me. So, uh, you know, basically it was an angle to get over uh, Razor Ramon, because if you recall, it was during the feud between Razor and Mike Rotundo IRS. So, yeah, it really, it, it, it didn't necessarily help my career 
uh, in the WWE, but it uh, certainly helped me with notoriety as far as the, uh, you know, the Pro Wrestling Illustrated and those kinds of magazines, um, you know, got, got major coverage. So right away there, I had indie, indie value level. You know, I was able to ask for a little bit more money. I, you know, I had some notoriety. Um, and then what really helped me get my break was, um, you know, I live 45 miles from uh, the headquarters over here in Stanford. I'm a Connecticut guy, and uh, Brian Lee was training at the time to uh, to do the Undertaker, the double Undertaker again, the fake Undertaker. Um, and I'd spent a week with Brian Lee and Mark uh, over there in Stanford working on the gimmick, and um, basically uh, after a week's worth of work, we had a dress rehearsal um, with Vince and Pat Patterson, who was uh, Vince's main man at the time, and Mark was there as well, Brian Lee, who uh, was in full Undertaker makeup, gear, the whole deal, and after that, uh, Pat Patterson approached me and uh, started asking me some questions, um, you know, like, hey, kid, you're a hell of a worker, um, where did you train, and I, you know, I said, hey, I trained with the hearts, and he goes, really, huh? And he goes, uh, what nationality are you, kid? And I said, well, I'm Portuguese. And he got a big pop. And he goes, hey, Vince, this kid here, he's Portuguese. I was like, okay. You know, I kind of didn't make anything of it. And he uh, continued. He goes, uh, so do you speak Portuguese? I said, well, yeah, absolutely, you know. And uh, lo and behold, they were looking for a Portuguese wrestler the whole time to do the Aldo Montoya gimmick. I guess the gimmick had been drawn up. They were just looking for somebody who spoke the language to fit it. Um, I guess originally they were supposed to go to Brazil, which is a Portuguese-speaking country, and uh, over obviously in Portugal, but, um, you know, that got my foot in the door, and uh, Vince McMahon actually approached me with the uh, contract offer at the next set of TV tapings in Lowell, Massachusetts. He took me outside, uh, you know, I think we were taping uh, super WWE superstars at the time, and uh, he said, you see that uh, American flag outside, PJ? Uh, that represents freedom. The land of opportunity. That's sort of what the World Wrestling Federation is, and we're offering you that opportunity. And, you know, he gave me the uh, land of opportunity speech, and uh, the rest is history. Wow, very cool. Yeah. Uh, what, what, <laughs> lucky to be, of that, be able to speak Portuguese, right? <laughs> hey, man, you know, you know what? It's uh, just like anything else in this business, and uh, really in the entertainment business. I had the ability, I had skill, but there's a lot of good guys with ability and skill that never make it. I was in the right place at the right time and a combination of things. And, uh, you know, and that's what it takes sometimes to get your foot in the door and get your big break. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that, that's real cool stuff. Uh, I, I, got, I wanted to, uh, real quick, and doing a little bit of homework, I came across something I was kind of unaware of, and that was in the spring of 94, like March or April, you had a short stint in World Championship Wrestling. Uh, you were with WCW for not that long. Like, what prompted your move over there to that company? And if there was any, what was the reasoning behind being there so shortly before going back with WWF? Well, really, that was just, uh, you know, I, I wasn't signed with anybody. So it was just, uh, you know, I was with Paul Roma, was a, a friend of mine. And, uh, you know, they were doing those tapings down in Disney, uh, you know, MGM, I think it was. And, um you know, I look, you know, come make a couple hundred bucks show, you know, and uh, come to Orlando with me for the week. And, uh, you know, I got to go down there and hang out with Paul Roma. And I actually met, met a, uh, a very, uh, well, not necessarily young, but younger, stunning Steve Austin. I spent a whole week uh, with him over there. And, and that, uh, during that time period, we actually traveled together. And, uh, you know, it was, it was fun, but, uh, you know. So it just, uh, just logistically speaking, from a geographic standpoint, uh, WWF at the time made uh, way more sense. So, you know, it's just uh, one of those things. You know, the opportunity presented itself. You know, this is a business. I took the money, and, you know, but nothing really came of it. You know, it's just, uh, it's, I'll tell you, it was a whole different deal, uh, WCW than WWE, the way they shot TV, the way they did everything. It was more of a television production down there as WWF at the time was more of a, you know, traditional wrestling promotion. So I, I guess you learn a little something new here every week on WGD Weekly. But uh, so then you you are back in the WWF, and I'm guessing around the time after that WCW spent just from the time period when all these other guys were coming in, that you kind of, that that must have been when you met and sort of befriended you know the click Scott Hall, uh, Waltman, Shawn Michaels, Kevin Nash, Triple H. Uh, could you bring us back and remember how you initially met those guys and became? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and that um, actually happened. It started with the PJ Walker days from the going back to the Microtendo thing. 
uh, Razor was involved in that, and uh, Scott always Scott always was a big fan of the younger generation. You know, he always wanted. To, he figured, you know, you you know, you hang with the young boy. He always picked the young boy to hang with. This way, you know. You learn from the guy, and he had his way of kind of passing the business on, you know, to the younger generation, and uh, which was really cool. So he already picked up uh, the one, two, three kid as a young boy, so to speak, and, uh, you know, him and I always got along, and, um, you know, from there I would travel with him. And actually, before I got the, the Aldo gimmick, uh, back then they ran two shows a night, and uh, the second show was usually in uh, high schools around the country. And uh, they had me opening the match, uh, uh, the opening match uh, on the cards. Uh, it usually would be like Razor and Sean headlining for the IC title. And uh, it would be me and the uh, Brooklyn Brawler, Steve Lombardi, in the opening match, PJ Walker versus Brooklyn Brawler. And, uh, you know, I did that for about six months just so I could hone my skills. And, uh, you know, Scott and I would travel uh, every night, you know, get in the car together, stay in the rooms together. And, uh, you know, then, uh, you know, as that progressed, I would hang, you know, Sean Waltman or Michaels or, you know, when Kev came in, we'd just rent cars together. And shortly after that, Triple H uh, got his shot, you know. So, yeah, I remember it all, man. It was just, uh, back then, it was just a buddy system, you know. You just had guys with life. Uh, interests traveling with each other because back then the money wasn't what it is today you got to understand that and this was before the monday night wars so we're doing three four to a car to save money on rental cars then you know what i mean and now was a young guy not making a whole hell of a lot of money so sure you know uh, you know you want to team up with guys like that and then too i knew that those were certainly the guys uh you'd want to hang out with and uh, learn from so uh you know i just took it as it came man are you still in touch with with that group a lot? Or? Oh, uh, actually, I just talked to Waltman uh, today on Twitter. Um, I haven't talked to Sean or Triple H in a minute. I saw Sean last year at a convention. Kevin, uh, I see all the time uh, on the indie scene. And uh, Scott, I, I, I speak to him on the phone uh, very, very too many times a week. We talk. <laughs> we're like we're like two girls on the phone sometimes. But yeah, I, I keep real close tabs on Scott and he on me and. Uh, you know, he's he's doing fantastic right now too, so I'm very proud of him yeah. as well. Very cool, very cool. Sounds like me and Steve a little bit with the phone calls. You mentioned something where you had spoken about Scott Hall and he takes uh you know, he would he'd go find a young guy, kinda of take him under his wing. And that is very interesting considering that everybody on the internet always wants to try to bury people and legends grow and um you know, it is what it is, but you know, it's he, they, they were not a bad group of guys, you know. I, I, they always treated me very, very well, and uh, you know, it, they really. I, I learned everything from those guys, you know. Uh, and, and those guys, being Shawn Michaels, Scott Hall, and uh, later on even Triple H, those aren't bad guys to really uh, to learn with and ride with. Cluster of world champions, certainly Hall of Fame material there. Let's uh, let's move along. As Aldo Montoya, you, you go to the W, back to WWF roughly. Uh, late 94, you stay there through around the spring of 1997, and then you show up uh, USWA and then ECW under the moniker of uh, PG-187. Let me give you a two-part question. I'll, I'll sit back and let you answer here. I, I wanted to address the USWA stop. You were a member of, uh, early member of the Nation of Domination in oh, USWA. <laughs> I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who were the other guys with you in that early incarnation of that faction? And were there ever talks when the Nation went to the WWF uh, for you to be part of that group? And if there was... Why did it eventually play out that way? And if there wasn't, what was the reason why? Uh, I don't. I, to be honest, I don't even really. Re I mean, I remember. I certainly remember being down there uh, in Memphis. It was a uh, six week, probably the worst six weeks of my life. I, um, I went, basically here's. The, I'll say it as quickly as I can. Uh, you know, I was getting very frustrated as Aldo. Obviously, the character way more than runs course. I mean, I was still being booked. I was still working, uh, making a living. But uh, you know, I was a very young man, 22, 23 years of age, and really starting to come into my own in the business. You know. Um, as a performer, so I wanted more, um, you know. So I went into Vince's office. I said, you know, I had an appointment. I didn't storm in, but I had an appointment, and I said, hey, look, you know, uh, I think I could do more. You know, let's change the gimmick, whatever. And uh, you know, they kind of uh, said, look, uh, you know, we're going to, um, you know, make you a heel, but you got to go to Memphis. And uh, you know, I said, okay. So I went down there and you know tried to learn to be a heel. And that's all, you know, it really, you know, the money was horrible. They were, I was getting paid $500 a week 
flat fee to work for Vince, but in Memphis through Vince. But that $500 a week barely covered my expenses at home, much less renting a car and renting hotels and, and eating. And you just imagine 500 bucks and living in two different places doesn't work. Not long after uh, you debut as Just Incredible, you embark on what I personally remember uh, as maybe your greatest rivalry, your Tommy Dreamer. There's yes. Countless exciting, brutal matches, even as the company nears its final days, take the world title from them and hold it for a great five month, five plus month run. Bring us, bring us through first your thoughts and recollections on the program with Dreamer, and then what does it mean to you as a performer after all those years to be the world champion and carry the ball for ECW? Uh, working with Dreamer, I, mean, I learned so much from Tommy. He really showed me. I mean, I knew how to work a WWE style, but he showed me how to work a ECW style, but really a main event style. Just interesting stuff, stuff I've never really uh, done before. And then uh, being the, you know, look, this is the entertainment business. So, uh, you know, having the world title in some ways is, in, is no more than being a movie character that happens to be the world champion. But what I, you know, why it means a little more to me personally is I never thought I could be in the wrestling business. You know, and to be world champion of any promotion means you're the, you're the figurehead. You have the chops to carry that. The wrestling industry at the time was booming. Uh, people were tuning in that they had never tuned in before. And it was a pretty great time to be a wrestling fan. I know Scum could agree with me there. And, 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 and for yourself, too, as a fan, watching all the programming that was on each week must have been pretty incredible. And for you to carry a championship at that point, not only a title belt, but, you know, ECW's work, that, that must have been pretty sweet, man. Yeah. And you move on and you meet up with Lance Storm again as the Impact players. You guys have a ton of chemistry. You add in Don Marie, which was a great fit. It seemed to me as a great fit anyway. Yeah. Let's believe this is the time where you get your uh, you get your catchphrase, not just the coolest, not just the best, but just incredible. That catchphrase comes to life. But uh, could you tell us what it was like some 15 years later after the Hart Brothers camp to be teaming up with Lance on the biggest stage W had to come. And also, since it just came up, I uh, came up with that catchphrase. Um, the catchphrase uh, was just something I said really one night in, in a promo that uh, just made it on a T-shirt. So you know, and uh, I just started rolling with it. I mean, sometimes uh, the best stuff is just stuff that happens very organically. And uh, yeah, it was just something that I said one day that just, uh, and then one day Paul created a shirt, and then it just, you know, I said, "Hey, that sounds cool." Everybody's kind of doing catchphrases. I'll just roll with it. <laughs> you know, um, but um, you know, with teaming with Lance was awesome, you know, and uh, and why, I think why it worked was, A, we were very comfortable with each other, B, um, you know, he, I always provided what he lacked as far as charisma and that brutal attitude, uh, very mean and rugged and, you know, beat you up and all that stuff, where Lance was, you know, get brought to the game, what I lacked was, you know, that finesse, maybe high-flying technical thing, you know, so it just, uh, both styles really complemented one another. And, uh, you know, it, it was just magic, man. It was, uh, it was, that was, that was wonderful to, to do. And those matches were so effortless as well, uh, working with Lance. It was, it was, and it, creatively too, that was uh, an amazing time. You, you know, it crosses over to many professions, but when you're able to work with someone you're close with and, you know, be able to get a job done, you know, usually the, the final product comes out maybe just a little bit better than normal. So that's some fantastic stuff. We got Just Incredible with us here at WGD Weekly. We only got a couple more questions for you, man. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, as they say, the, the, the old mantra is all thing, good things come to an end, and we're running to the point here where ECW was starting to uh, go down the road where – the point of no return where they're about ready to cease operations. So tell us about how it was in the locker room, you or yourself specifically, but some of your other friends, when you started to find out that ECW is no longer going to be in existence. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was very, uh, it was very bad. Uh, well, I mean, it was more sad than bad. I mean, Paul, look, I was really happy working there. I mean, I was making good money. I was making $150,000 a year and, um, you know, and to wrestle really twice a week. I mean, uh, being home a lot more than I would uh, with the other two companies. So uh, what really um, what bothered me more was, you know, now I'm uh, going into the territory of the unknown. You know, uh, you know, WCW was obviously having trouble too. So 
you know, at that point, you really, you were either going to WWE or you weren't going. And it, it was a thing of timing as well, because now with the company going under and WCW being bought, you really have to, you know, that drags your price way down because there's no competition from a, excuse me, negotiation standpoint. So, you know, it was really, uh, I had to get out before the door officially closed, which I did. And, uh, you know, I emailed Jim Ross. He uh, emailed me right back. There was interest. Got a contract drawn up. And uh, before the doors officially closed, uh, I was there. With You know, debuted uh, not in Nassau Coliseum. Uh, ironically enough, with the X-Pac and Chris Jericho match where I came in and uh, hit Jericho with the chair. And uh, then we did the X-Factor tag team, which, uh, you know, was... In concept, a great idea, Sean and I obviously going way back. But, uh, you know, they just, uh, you know, they were trying to recreate an X, an, a DX kind of gimmick. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I just don't think Albert ever uh, really clicked uh, as a, you know, he was the odd man out as far as being a big guy. You know, we wanted that big, he, you know, almost like the Kevin Nash, Shawn Michaels thing. We wanted that big guy to help the two little guys, you know, um, but it just never clicked. Um, and uh, obviously, Sean Waltman at the time, too, was having negotiation problems uh, with restructuring his contract. So, you know, that didn't, you know, we had good matches. The gimmick, you know, got a little push from the start. But, you know, you also have WCW guys coming in. Everybody, we had 60, 70 guys on the roster. So it was very easy to get lost in the shuffle at that time, you know. So, uh, unfortunately, that's what happened. And, uh, you know. Then things just disappeared. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, yeah, it had to be top. Speaking of which, uh, the next question I wanted to ask, and Steve's got one more for you, um, <clears throat> was speaking kind of to what you were saying, that roster of, uh, you know, so many people on there. You said 60 or 70 guys. Now, someone on our uh, Facebook page, Wrestling Glory Days, the other day, had had some comments on there that I believe you and Sean Waltman had made speaking about um, – what's kind of gained infamy across uh, internet sites and stuff about the infamous uh, plane ride there. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. I was, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind uh, just, again, we're no stranger to having a good time, myself and Steve, so uh, Not at all. I'd be remiss if I, did, if I didn't ask you to kind of uh, someone with a front row seat there if you couldn't uh, kind of rehash what went down there for us. Well, I mean, it was just, I mean, believe me, I mean, at that time, I was a full-blown uh, drug addict, <laughs> to be honest with you, but, uh, so, uh, you know, I was just, and I wasn't the bad one at the time, even so that you can imagine that plane, right, I was sober, I was not sober, but uh, awake for, for that, we had Vince McMahon and uh, Kurt Angle going at it, you know, trying to wrestle each other in the aisles, then you had Kurt Henning and, uh, you know, doing all kinds of mischief, uh, and X-Pac, um, clipping uh, Michael Hayes' ponytail, and then uh, I forgot, yeah, because he was so drunk that he, uh, you know, Bradshaw had got busted open the night before on a pay-per-view, and he opened him up on the plane, and then uh, it was Brock and Vince, I forgot, it was Brock and Vince that were wrestling, I believe, and then almost uh, blew the door, you know, they almost went into the emergency door and did some kind of damage, I mean, it was just, I, I, it was just ridiculous, I mean, everybody was drunk, I had to wheel Scott Hall, who was passed out uh, through customs in uh, LaGuardia. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> you know, it was just, it was just, just debauchery, flare naked on the robe. I mean, you know, you, you put up a, a private plane with uh, unlimited amount of booze, uh, that's what you're going to, and, and, and a lot of drugs, that's what you're going to get. Yeah, well, again, just, just, just those names that you dropped there, that, that, that speaks to the talent that was on the roster anyway, right? <laughs> right, yeah, no shit. Being pro wrestling fans and you're on the internet all the time, you see all these crazy like uh, Photoshop stuff. And I actually saw one the other day of the Last Supper with 12 wrestlers and Vince in the middle being Jesus. So whoever did that was crazy. But I would love to see one of those paintings of a, of a scene from that plane ride. I yeah, don't know if my garage. <laughs> well, we're going to move on, Justin. It's been awesome having you here. i got one more question for you, and it's regarding ECW. There's a couple of reincarnates of, e of ECW, pardon me. There's been a couple of reincarnations of ECW throughout WWE programming, and I just wanted to ask you, you you're an ECW guy. I can When I hear the name Justin Credible, I immediately assimilate you to ECW and not any of the other gimmicks that you wrestled. 
so what was it like, um, including the other guys that were ECW originals, coming through the invasion, uh, through ECW, reward, through all these other different uh, reincarnates of ECW? What, what was your, and the guys, what was your overall opinion of that type of stuff? Well, anytime they wanted to do it, uh, we were always told it was going to be authentic, it was going to be the real deal, especially the last time in 2006. Um, you know, and uh, we were very excited. Obviously, the one-night stand that Vince uh, put on was amazing, and uh, that was an ECW production, don't get it twisted, and, uh, you know, down to the cameraman. And, uh, you know, they, they, they in 2006, they did a second one, which was much more... Uh, WWE orientated and you know but we all I got my con you know I got a contract offer in 2006 was there and uh, you know it was just uh, you could just see after a month or two you know Vince doesn't handle any you know the, the demand was there but Vince doesn't you know his ego gets in the way I'm not you know I, I have no problem saying that Vince has an ego the size of <laughs> I mean you know uh, it, it's amazing and he if it's not his creation he's not going to put it over so you know, uh, he just uh, went his own way with it, and uh, obviously it shit the bed. And, uh, you know, it's a shame, but, hey, hey, you know, it is what it is. ECW isn't, it would never work, though, in that situation because we were the anti-WWE. Now we're bought, now we're run by the corporation, you know. So it, right there, that's, you know what I mean. It, it, they meant, you know, it was in, in, in theory it sounded great, but... You know, we were the middle finger to those promotions, and now, you know, we're being run by that promotion. So, you know, a lot of people just buy it. And uh, rightfully so. You know, we saw the end result. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I always thought it was a little far fetched when they had ECW join WCW for the alliance there, you know. Yeah. It didn't seem like they would fit too well together, you know. Yeah, absolutely, man. What are you doing now, Justin? You got a uh, you got a YouTube channel. I know you wanted to promote Pro Wrestling 101. Tell us a little bit yeah. about what you got going on YouTube. Well, I'll try to make it quick as quick as possible. Uh, basically, I mean, this past uh, since last year, really November nineteenth, two thousand twelve, is a very special day. Um, I uh, finally, you know, after, you know, uh, I don't think it's any secret. Uh, I was really bad drug addict. Uh, you know, started with pain pills, went to IV heroin, and uh, you know, I was just a broken man. And I was doing drugs back in 2006 during the ECW since the reincarnation of ECW. I was a shell of myself, and uh, you know, really, uh, really on the verge, on the verge of being another tragedy in this business. Um, I finally had the balls to um, to get some accountability, and I called WWE for help. Um, they put me through treatment, and uh, since November 19th of last year, um, I've been clean and sober, and uh, I just really had, uh, made a decision, you know, I said, look, I've had a great career, I'm 39 years old, um, why, why am I going to go out like this, you know, why am I going to, you know, why can't I do something, you know, at 39 years old with the experience that I have, there's no reason why, now that I'm clean and sober, get it together and uh, give it one last shot, so uh, really the pro wrestling 101 was just uh, a vehicle, you know, I did Colt Cabana, I'm sure you all know Colt, I did his mm -hmm. podcast, uh, which has, you know, a tremendous amount of followers, I did that, um, and uh, he motivated me to kind of said, look, you know, Nowadays, if you're not on TNA or if you're not on WWE, you know, it's your responsibility to, to use social media to your benefit. And I said, you know what, you're absolutely right. So uh, I did the 101 thing to kind of uh, like a for wrestlers, by wrestlers, and for wrestling fans. You know, it's, it's really the inner workings of this business, uh, you know, being told by a 21-year veteran of this business. And, um, you know, it's a unique thing, and we're definitely going uh, in different directions, too, not just the wrestling tutorial, so to speak. We're going to have some comedy. We're doing an Aldo Montoya. Where are they now that should debut very soon? We're actually in production, and I'm working with a former WWE uh, production guy. Uh, he's my partner that produces them because they're very well produced. So uh, we have a, a lot of fun stuff we're going to do, and uh, we're also thinking of doing a four-part shoot interview because it you know, seems to be... You know, so uh, so many fans want to hear about it, and I certainly have uh, the stories to tell. So uh, we got a lot of exciting stuff. I got Scott Hall coming on the show uh, very soon. I got uh, Velvet Sky, who's a uh, native of my hometown, Waterbury, Connecticut, and I had a hand in her training back in the day. So uh, a lot of cool stuff, and uh, really, I'm using that as a vehicle to uh, 
to give this business one more run, you know, so if anybody out there like Ring of Honor, TNA, or oh, even Uncle Vince <laughs> wants to give this old man a shot, I think at 39 years, 39 years young, I should say, and uh, clean and sober, and, you know, um, I think it could uh, really help, uh, help the business out in some way, so we'll see what happens. You know, saying clean and sober, those are the two words that rang out clearer than anything else in this interview. Extremely happy for you, man. It's a tough road when you get hooked up in that stuff, and we're both extremely proud of you being able to come out of the doldrums and uh, knock it out. We wish you the best of luck, uh, but this has been fantastic stuff, Just Thanks so much for doing this, man. All right, fellas. It's always a pleasure, man. I appreciate it. Well, Scum, we have uh, one heck of we got a full play to talk about here with Just Incredible. What do you think, man? Yeah, yeah, great stuff, great stuff. I, I uh, always a fan of his. I know you are too. Always a fan of the old ECW. You know, I liked how he kind of likened ECW to the group, that was almost like the middle finger that was sticking up at the WWE and uh, WCW. I know you can speak for some of our days gone by where our uh, musical acts might have been somewhat of the middle finger that stuck up at a few other people, if you know what I'm saying. Oh, absolutely. You know, something that I always enjoyed about ECW is they were very ironic in their humor. So they, you know, they did. They stuck the middle finger up the uh, WWF, WWE, Vince McMahon, Eric Bischoff, and WCW. And they did it in a very odd way sometimes. It's during their matches, Joey Styles, one, you know, a very underrated announcer in my opinion, there's always a spot in any match where somebody may have to come up with a little bit of blood on their head. And they always kind of gave a little dig as some of the bigger federations for ignoring what was actually happening. Just one small example of the humor that they added to their shows, which I thought was great. It was a, it was on at a great time too. Cause like you said, we're young guys, we're out having a couple, we come home, it's late at night, throw on ECW and the place is guaranteed to get demolished. So thanks Paul Heyman for never getting my security deposit back on any apartment ever from 96 to 2000. Appreciate it. Yeah, right, right, right. Absolutely. Although, thank you, Sabu, Sandman, Justin. Uh, thanks to all you guys for us. Like, me literally at one point winding up through the plaster of the wall of Steve's living room. Thank you for that. Yeah, smashing tin cans over your head like the Sandman. Yeah, that hurts. Yeah. And you're going to bleed, been, I promise. Been there before. I have seen this man bleed before. There's no doubt about it. A couple things I thought were real interesting that Justin dropped off on us, and I'm sure you had your points, too. Uh, I thought it was really cool, his beginnings. Uh, he was brought in to train when they were doing the Undertaker, Undertaker gimmick. Uh, you know, he, him and with Brian Lee and the Undertaker, and uh, Vince walks him out of the parking lot and points out the American flag, and this represents freedom, young man. This represents opportunity. You know, I, I, I thought that was a pretty cool intro to WWF, right? I've known you long enough, Scum, and I know we're thinking the exact same thing. Look That's at the right. flag. You, right. you now are a man of war. Yeah. Damn it. I, I can hear it. I can hear it. Getting back to one of our first shows when we talked around sitting around that gimmick table with him. Now get in the <laughs> ring and lose, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. That's right. <laughs> you got to be one hell of a salesman to not only get someone to go along with a gimmick that's sure to fail and then tell them how great they're doing while they're losing. So hats off to Vince McMahon for being a, the P.T. Barnum of the new age, I'd have to say. I don't know about you, Scott. Sure. I, I, on his behalf, though, if Vince McMahon's coming out and Pat Patterson is dropping his jaw saying that, hey, we found this guy, he's Portuguese, Vince has been looking for this gimmick he has, if I'm in those shoes, I'm jumping through hoops to make it happen, too, man. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, keep in mind, though, the key to that point of the story, what I got out of it is that he was one hell of a hand in the ring, and you can thank the Hart, Foundation, or the Hart family for that up in the dungeon in Calgary. There's not too many people that have ever walked out of that building and said they were okay in the ring. Every single one of them, and you can name dozens of wrestlers that have been trained by the Hearts up in Calgary, and every single one of them, to a man, underrated in the ring or one of the best ever? Well, I would say, you know, I think he said he's at 39 years old right now, you know, clean and sober, which is fantastic. You know, obviously awesome. he brought up, we, you know, we don't go there. We weren't going to go there. But he had brought so, up that he has some personal demons that he's overcome. 
you know, all that aside, it, you cannot deny the guy was a fantastic worker in the ring. I mean, hey, look at the, they give him the strap in ECW for almost half a year. I mean, like he was saying, it was the big three then. He had 150 grand a year he's making, uh, headline and pay-per-views as the world champion. I mean, undeniable, he was like, you know, he just needed that chance and that he said they got together, him and uh, Paul Heyman and the just incredible gimmick with part Razor, part Sean, and part Flair with a little bit of extreme attitude. I thought that was really cool. When you walk to the ring with a Singapore cane, my friend, it's going to get used, which means we got an exciting matchup on hand. Just incredible. One heck of a worker in ECW held the strap. Something very few people can say, Scum, because as a matter of fact, the ECW title was really only swapped after Extreme, when it went from Eastern to Extreme, it was really only swapped between about, and again, off the top of my head, maybe six or seven people. So he was in, he was breathing some rarefied air with that strap. Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, that, that was, uh, that was a great run, you know, and from the sound of it, like he said, and that's what I was hoping when I go to that question, because I know from the sound of it, and with the Pro Wrestling 101, that his new YouTube channel there, you can tell when you tune into that, the guy loves the business of wrestling. You know, it's what he wanted to do. And then you're the world champion. And uh, regardless of, you know, how he compared it to being a movie character of some sort, it's, it's an honor. You know, it's an honor to uh, carry that title and to be given that spot. And, you know, very deserving, someone who busted his ass, you know, to get there and, uh, you know, paid his dues for sure. And it's a great story that he did wind up there, you know, and, uh I, I, exactly how he described it was what I was expecting, you know, and, and, and that's pretty cool. Anybody out there listening who has any connections to anything that comes on the air Monday nights, Thursday nights, Saturday mornings, whatever the case may be, you're looking at one hell of a worker and certainly someone I want to see on my television screens come. Absolutely, absolutely. Kind of change gears here, though, on you, Steve, if you don't mind. Uh, that's all, you know, boy. You, you know I'm right. You know I'm right on page with you. I'd love to see just incredible in any capacity in any of the major companies, and you know, I, I, I'm sure that he would come back and he would do the same job that he did when he was carrying ECW. But I got to say again, it was something that I, I had to drop the question about. Once described, it kind of remind me of maybe a uh, two, three o'clock in the morning down in our own place on. Uh, Fifth and Erie Street. If any any of the listeners that get that know what I'm getting at, um, no. you got you got Kurt Angle and Vince McMahon wrestling in the aisle of an airplane. You got X Pac hacking off Michael P. S. Hayes' ponytail. Brock Lesnar and Kurt Henning wrestling each other to the point that they knock the door open on an open moving airplane. Bradshaw busted wide open from the night before and bleeding all over the place. Scott Hall passed out at Customs in LaGuardia, and Ric Flair naked, strutting, wooing through the plane with just a robot. I've, honestly, out of all of that, I came up out of it a little bit upset that we weren't on that plane. <laughs> I think we would have fit right in, though. I, I, not that I would have wanted to lock up with Lesnar or Henning or Angle or shit, even McMahon. <laughs> we stay right you know, out of that, but would have been fun know, to be a fly on the wall. Oh, absolutely. You bring it up again. And now, folks, for those of you who don't know me, Vince McMahon is one of my favorite on-screen characters, maybe my favorite heel character of all time, my favorite villain, Mr. McMahon, the boss. I personally like the guy, and I know that he's got a lot of, you know, he's a, I don't know how you say, they love him or you hate him, very polarizing guy. I love the guy. He's the owner of a company. He's a billionaire hammered in the aisle of an airplane wrestling with someone. That's your boss on the plane, and that's not the first story we've heard of that. There's a legendary story about one crazy night out at the bars with the Hearts and the Road Warriors and, and Vince McMahon running around wanting everybody to give him their finisher, and sure enough, Brett the Hitman Hart nearly takes his head off with a heart attack. Funny stuff. So you got to see, and again now, this is why I kind of like the guy, is because he's not afraid to get his hands dirty in and out of the ring or when the camera's on or off. So hats off to Vince McMahon for not stopping it. Good for him. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, unfortunately, when uh, the plane dropped down and when they returned stateside, I think that a uh, few of the members of the roster that made me he felt were expendable, heard those famous two lines that 
you and I know so well, Steve. But uh, that, that's another story, you know, uh, for another time, I suppose. Uh, one more thing before we uh, wrap up and tell the, tell the uh, listeners what we got going on. Another thing that I thought was real interesting, and you know, much like you're saying, I'm, I, again, Vince McMahon, I have nothing but respect for the guy made the business, and you got to take your hat off to a billionaire, uh, the owner, CEO of a company of that magnitude, dropping 14 feet off a cage through a table and getting busted open with a chair shot here and there. Just, you know, he don't need to do that. I mean, that's that's a guy who's passionate about what he does times 50. But what I wanted to lead touch by on, you know, example. yeah, lead by example, exactly. What I wanted to touch on, well, you know, one of my favorites uh, of all time, uh, friend of our guest today, a close personal, sounded like a mentor, Scott Hall. And again, it, he, you know, like you said and brought up to him there, sometimes gets a bad rap. You know, he even said maybe a little abrasive the personality. Scott Hall was all, regardless of people want to say and what the myth said, he always, you know, was one that seemed willing to, like Justin said today, work with the younger guy, help the younger guy, take the bumps, put people over, even when he was with Nit- when he was on Nitro and Red Hot with the NWO. When he was Razor, the classic match that kind of made Sean Waltman the one, two, three kid in the early days of Raw. Um, it was good to hear that. I mean, I think people forget that. Now I know a lot of people are behind Scott and that he's, uh, like Justin is doing, you know, it's on the clean and sober track. And I think everyone hopes to see him in some capacity one day, you know, when he does conquer those demons. But it's cool to hear Scott Hall get called out as, you know, for what he was, someone who helped the guys out and helped the younger guys out. You don't hear that that much. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Everybody's so quick to tell the story about him wanting to kick out of the 3D when he came over in the NWO right after the invasion, always talking about, oh, I'm going to kick out of your maneuver. Or I believe, in, and Scum, we had a discussion the other day in our, in our production meeting. You were speaking about a certain, and, I, and, I, and again, now, I don't, you told me the story, so maybe you could rehash it, about Scott Hall and saying that uh, it's so great to do 450 splashes like all of the uh, – luchadors there, Cybernetico and Super Colo and all those other guys, but he can go into the ring, throw somebody into a side headlock and get a bigger pop. Well, the, the story was, and that was not a story that was told to me, just to be clear. I, I personally have never met the man, uh, but what I, I was reading, someone had reposted a comment from Mark Madden, the old that uh, used to announce in the later days of Nitro with another former guest of ours, Scott Hudson. Um, Madden had mentioned something in regards to that injury to the Ring of Honor wrestler that got spiked with the pile driver recently, hurt his neck. Yes. Um, yes. His name's neck, name isn't coming to me off the top of my head. But uh, anyway, what Madden said is it reminded of a comment one time Scott Hall had said when a lot of the cruiserweights and stuff were doing all the crazy moves and there were a lot of injuries when they were all at Nitro. And, you know, the comment that he said went something, again, this isn't verbatim, and, I, I, again, it wasn't said to me. I just saw it posted somewhere, was that, um, you know, they come to the back, and everyone was like, wow, great match, wow, great match. And Scott Hall had mentioned something along the lines of, yeah, great match, yeah, the, the, all the flips and all the whatever, and people were going crazy. Now I'll go out there and get a bigger pop from a side headlock, meaning – you guys are killing yourself out there, you know. If you're gonna be, you're gonna be in a wheelchair, kind of thing. I, you know, I don't necessarily know that it meant it was meant to be how people take it, being that it's Scott Hall and the reputation that precedes him. But really, what Madden was saying was, you know, it, it, it makes a lot of sense in that you can, if you put into your character and work on working the crowd and getting over the crowd, a side headlock from a character that people love just to see, you know. Sometimes that guy can do a lot more just with his persona than he can by doing a triple flip out of the balcony through four tables that are stacked and set on fire with three people laying under it on a bed of nails, you know? Absolutely. I guess if you're going to have five moves to do, make them five good ones. That's right. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> WGD Weekly with Stephen the Scum we move on we got another segment upcoming here folks called Stump the Scum I'm very excited to see how this one goes following that we got the gimmick garage sale ton of giveaways here at WGD Weekly stay tuned with us we're here every Sunday night at 6pm follow Wrestling's Glory Days on Facebook for the best classic wrestling content on the internet today tomorrow or ever Scum it's been one hell of an interview I know we got a lot more to get to so we'll be right back 
Well, folks, the WGD Weekly, we got a lot going on. we got a full slate here in September. We're just going to give you a couple of dates. This is September 1st. We had Just Incredible. Of course, next week, a living legend, Larry Zabisco. That's just halfway through the month of September. Who knows what else Steve and the Scum have in store for you? Yeah, a couple of legends. I know Larry goes by the name Legend. Uh, take a trip to Larry Land on the 15th, uh, if you will. And uh, You're watching too many old reruns of primetime wrestling and uh, superstars of wrestling on Saturday morning. Scum, we got a lot more going on, too. we got Stump the Scum. We're going to take your emails up until the 5th of September. Our show airs the 8th. We'll make sure that we get all your questions in. Don't forget to email steventhescum at gmail.com. Send us all your pictures for the gimmick garage sale. Send us your questions to Stump the Scum. we got plenty of great prizes. I know, Scum, you sent me a little. I was privy to a little information on some of our special prizes. I know we've talked about them briefly in the past. You want to fill our listeners in as to what they're going to get for winning if they beat Stump the Scum. Yeah, if, uh, once again, that category, you got a few days left, is SummerSlam 1998 through 92. Submit your questions to steventhescum at gmail.com. Make sure in the header you put Stump the Scum so we don't confuse it with our other con- contests that we have going on. And um, what you'll be getting, the winner, if you can Stump the Scum, which I don't think you can do, baby, but regardless, yeah. you'll, you'll be getting a, copy of Lex Luger's autobiography, Wrestling with the Devil, forward written by the legendary Sting, Lex's good friend. It's going to take you the life and times of the total package, the good and the bad, all the way through his entire career, WCW, um, time in the Four Horsemen, time in the WWF, uh, spanning the man's whole life. Great read, fantastic read, and if you can stump the scum, <clears throat> on our September 8th show next week following the Tito Santana interview, you'll get a free copy compliment to Steve and the Scum. Uh, Steve also has his new segment coming up, and that's Steve's Gimmick Garage Sale. Keep those pictures coming. It's great stuff that's coming in, real funny stuff. Uh, the most ridiculous, the most absurd, who would ever buy this wrestling merchandise? Send that to the same email, steventhescum at gmail.com. Make sure in the header you got the gimmick garage sale so we know what you're looking for here. The winner of whoever has their item selected that Steve sells on the air is going to get an autographed 8x10 photo of WWE Hall of Famer, the legendary Boogie Woogie Man, Jimmy Valiant. And Steve, if real briefly, hang on one second, hang on one second, if I could speak to the my own segment next week, I just wanted to remind everyone out there that <clears throat> the scum is not some hick, baby. He is not oh, some huge wrestling fan. And more so than anything, and you can speak to this, just like all the listeners out here can speak to it, and that is the scum is the newest sensation that is sweeping the wrestling radio nation because the scum has got the brains, baby. You know, Scum, I wouldn't be too proud of being in the latest Internet sensation, considering the last Internet sensation was a bunch of footage of Abdullah the Butcher giving someone else hepatitis C, or at least they say they did. Well, I can't speak to that. Uh, the only disease I can speak to is stupidity, baby. And that is all I'm seeing when I'm talking about the, these questions. Now, I don't get to look at them, but I can only imagine some of the questions coming in here. And if they think they're going to stuff the scum, they're dead wrong, baby. Once again, we all know who's got the brains. You know what? There's one guy out there in the land of the Internet that I hope sends a, sends the scum a question and stumps the scum. There's a guy that out of one of everybody's favorite episodes of The Simpsons, I think he, I don't know if he has a real name. I like to call him the comic book guy. And I know that he always has an opinion on everything. I've tried to get in touch with his publicist to try to get him on the show, Scum, because I'd love to see you two face off in a battle of, I guess, wits. Yeah, well, if he could get his nose out of the cheese whiz canister lining up, maybe we could. It, 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 something that he would have in common with some of our readers out there. And that's that open shirt sitting on the couch and brushing off the Cheeto dust, baby. You better do oh. your homework, people, because next week is when it starts. That was the worst thing you've ever said. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So anyway, Steve, before we wrap up here, we'd like to thank Justin Credible former ECW champion for coming on and sharing his time in the 
sharing the memories of his time in the wrestling business. Come back next week. You're, you are not going to miss the debut of those two segments. The following week on the 15th, we got the living legend Larry Zabisco and the return of the ever popular Beat Nick Body Slam. Steve, there's irons in the fire. It's red hot. We got tons of good guests, tons of great prizes and great giveaways coming up. You got anything more before we sign off here, my man? Yes. Stay tuned every Sunday night at 6 o'clock. WGD Weekly with Stephen the Scum. Get on Facebook.com slash Wrestling Glory Days for the best classic wrestling content on the Internet today. Thanks so much for joining us again this week. On behalf of the Scum, my name's Steve, and we'll say so. Have a good week, people.